Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. It is Tuesday, June 16th, and we'll start our meeting by introducing you to your City Council. Council members Erickson? Here. Erpenbach? Here. Jameson? Here. Karski? Here. Kylie? Here. Rolfing? Here. Staggers? Present. Anderson? Here. Thank you, Council. Appreciate that. Um, we will start our meeting, as we always do, with an invocation. We're very, very pleased to have Senior Pastor Randy Gehring of our Savior's Lutheran Church here in Sioux Falls back with us to give our blessing. We appreciate it. What we'd ask you to do is to stand for the blessing, remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance after that. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mayor. I'd like to read tonight a psalm that we read at our Savior's this last weekend as part of our worship. It's Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord adorned, ordained his blessing, life forevermore. I invite you to pray with me. <laughs> oh God, you provide everything we need. With all of creation, we offer our thanks, even as we seek to follow your example of generosity and grace. Give this community the vision and the will to strive toward unity. Give us ears to hear the cries of our neighbors, Give us eyes to see the plight of those who suffer. And give us hearts that overflow with love for all your children. <laughs> Guide the work of these leaders whom you have set apart for service in this community. Be present with them in all their deliberations and grant them wisdom, patience, faithfulness in their serving, and a passion for working for the good of all. Bless us and all your people. Teach us to value your gifts of diversity and community and make us instruments of peace. We pray this humbly, recognizing that you are God, trusting in your perfect goodness and relying upon your promise to provide everything we need. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pastor Twan, is uh, Pastor here? I don't see him. Well, very good. Well, uh, I do have a proclamation that I would like to read on behalf of uh, uh, Pastor Twan Jackson. Uh, the proclamation reads, Whereas Juneteenth is a celebration of the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, which was issued by U.S. President Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. The proclamation gave the Southern slaves their freedom and is considered an important benchmark in the African-American struggle for freedom and equality. Whereas the word Juneteenth comes from the words June and 19th, which, according to Southern folklore, is when the slaves of Texas first learned of their freedom. Though technically freed in 1863, the slaves did not learn of their freedom until the arrival of the Union soldiers on June 19th, 1865. This was after the end of the Civil War and two and one half years after the proclamation was first issued, whereas the Emancipation Proclamation is considered the catalyst that ended slavery. But at the time the proclamation was issued, it really did not free anyone since the Confederate States did not recognize President Lincoln's authority. It was not until the Civil War ended that the 13th Amendment 
to the U.S. Constitution ratified in 1865 officially outlawed slavery. Whereas Juneteenth began as a celebration by ex-slaves and has continued to be a widely celebrated event across the United States among all nationalities. Recently, there have been efforts to bring a wider audience to the celebration right here in South Dakota. Now, therefore, I, Mike Cuther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim June 19th, 2015 as Juneteenth, 2015 in Sioux Falls. Thank you all. Council, thank you. Well, we'll now move to our consent agenda. Any motions, changes, um, discussion points? <clears throat> move for approval. Second, Rolfing. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve our consent agenda, seconded by Councilor Rolfing. Any discussion? Councilor? Yeah, I'd just like to pull uh, one item from the uh, consent calendar, and it's the Prairie Hills West Park at $469,500. Councilor, thank you. We'll be happy to do that. If there is, yes, Councilor. Mayor, also I've asked uh, the pavilion to come and speak to the entertainment venue, Washington Pavilion, uh, building improvements, roofing for one, $1,230,455. Councilor, thank you. We'll certainly tackle that one as well. Uh, if there are no other items, uh, yes, Councilor Urmbach, um, sorry. Mr. Mayor, if we could also pull the item that's highways and streets, the 2015 bridge inspection program agreement for engineering services for Clark Engineering for $15,795, please. All right, Council, anything else? Forget a roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson. Yes. That is fast eight to zero. Council, our regular agenda. Any uh, motions or changes uh, to that? Move to. Second, uh, Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve the item. Seconded by Councilor Urban Bach. If no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members er Erickson? Yes. Urban Bach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. <laughs> that is past eight to zero. Uh, folks, welcome to tonight's city council meeting. We're certainly pleased to have you here. This is an opportunity for you to engage the council on really any topic uh, that you think is, is important uh, for, for our town. Uh, if it is an item that is later on in the agenda, we'd ask you to wait until that time. But otherwise, come forward. Just two things. We'd ask you to uh, just introduce yourself to, to the people of our town. And then secondly, we'd ask you to keep your comments to five minutes or less. Welcome. <clears throat> Good evening, Greg Neitzert, Sioux Falls. In recent years, user fees have been increasing substantially in some cases. The most obvious examples are water and sewer rates. We've seen our water rates almost double. Now the city is proposing enormous increases in outdoor pool rates. All of these increases come at a time when we are experiencing record tax revenues. The mayor himself refers to our city as a boom town. In the last 10 years, sales tax collections are up 62% and property tax collections have doubled. We're literally swimming in revenue. We are spending enormous amounts of money on leisure and entertainment venues, some of which are private and, by, and most by virtue of their costs will not be accessible by many or even most citizens. Examples include the indoor tennis and hockey facilities, which are both private, the Washington Pavilion, the event center, and now the indoor pool. Ostensibly, these user fees are increasing so that the fee paid by the user more closely reflects the cost of the service provided. If the city were a private business, that would make sense. If your fee didn't reflect the cost of the service, you'd go out of business after all. But the city isn't a business, it's a government. And unlike a business, you have an additional significant revenue stream. It's called taxes. We're all paying forced user fees in effect, whether we like it or not, and whether or not we use a particular service. 
Since you have this additional revenue stream, you don't have to charge the true cost to every recipient of a service to break even. We can subsidize certain services we wish to make accessible to everyone. As an example, we can charge citizens who use our outdoor pools far less than what the service actually costs if we choose to. If we choose to prioritize our tax dollars, we can do it very easily, in fact. We've done exa exactly that for a number of years. Why would the city want or need to raise user fees, for example, water rates, at a time when tax collections are at record highs? The answer seems obvious. We need to make room in the budget to pay for all of this spending on entertainment venues. Even with record revenues, money is still finite. By shifting capital improvements on our water and sewer system to enterprise funds, funded by user fees, we free up millions of dollars in the CIP for bond payments, construction costs, and capital improvements on entertainment. Sales tax dollars once used for critical infrastructure are now being used to pay for expensive leisure options for select groups. This cost shift is brilliant and cynical at the same time. It sounds so logical. Why not charge people who actually use the service? In actuality, since we all continue to pay taxes and now we have a huge increase in user fees like our water bill, we've all endured a large stealth tax increase and most people don't even realize it. In effect, every citizen is paying for the event center every month when they get their water bill. As they say, there's no free lunch. Little old ladies on a fixed income are paying more for their water so I can see an Ed Sheeran concert. The same is true for all of the other leisures we've constructed or funded in recent years. The people who can least afford them are impacted the most by these user fee increases and are funding entertainment for those of us who can afford it. This entire paradigm is morally reprehensible. Even more unbelievable, although we've had record tax revenues over the last decade and user fees are rising, in some cases substantially, we've quadrupled the city debt load from 92 million to 360 million. We're increasing our spending much faster than our revenues are growing, which is incredible, given that we're gro growing our revenues so quickly. Obviously, we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem, and we have a priorities problem. Those of us doing well have more entertainment options than ever before. A large segment of our residents, perhaps even the majority, don't have the disposable income to enjoy all of these options. And they're being asked to pay for them through increased user fees, such as water and sewer and other core services have to be cut, eliminated, or delayed to make room for the spending. And now we're proposing to make those citizens pay for our entertainment through huge increases in pool rates. The city proposes to quadruple the cost of a season pass for a child, double the cost of a season pass for a family or a senior, eliminate free passes for reduced income families, and to limit the definition of a family to five people. The city also proposes to increase daily rates. And all of these huge increases won't even get you into the indoor pool. You'll have to buy a separate pass at a cost of $300 a person for that privilege. Anyone who is naive enough to believe the indoor pool was for all citizens ought to know better by now. This proposal, given our current revenues, is totally unnecessary and frankly offensive. We certainly have the operating budget to subsidize the cost of outdoor pools for our citizens, particularly for those with lower incomes if we simply choose to. At a time we are spending tens of million dollars on a facilities a minority of us will ever use, the least we can do is keep our outdoor pools affordable for the rest of our citizens. We have the money, we just have to make it a priority. It's time to put the average citizen first. It's time to stop making the average citizen and those without a voice shoulder the burden for all of the spending. Say no to these fee increases. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Really appreciate that. Folks, is there anybody else who wanted to engage the council? Welcome. <clears throat> Bruce Daniels in Sioux Falls. I attended my first park board meeting today and recorded it for Sioux Falls to see when I get it posted. And while I was sitting there, and over the last few months I've been thinking about this more and more often, is why can't the city of Sioux Falls also record these meetings so we can witness the thoughtful discussion I saw today? We waste city resources on so many fluff pieces being played on CityLink that it, where we seem to be highlighting certain people and certain events in town that have very little to do with how the this, this city should be governed. Why not make our boards and committees more public? We witnessed a group of seven Sioux Falls residents remind the Parks Department that the parks and pools are for everyone today. Promises were made by this administration prior to the 2014 vote. There would not be a two-tier rate system for indoor versus outdoor pool use. We expect the promises to be kept. The, the indoor pool 
is still a, a neighborhood pool in Spellerberg. Why should the Spellerberg families not be allowed to swim like everybody else? If you have a two-tier rate system for the indoor pool versus the outdoor pool, the people in Spellerberg are going to be discriminated against on the pool system. So we were promised, and we have it up online, the four uh, videos that show exactly what Don Kearney had promised us, and we would like to see that held true. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denison. We appreciate that. <laughs> Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on any topic? Welcome. Evening, Mayor. Mayor Huther, how are you? Good, thank Good. you. Uh, my name is Tawan Jackson, the pastor of Friendship Baptist Church. Tawan, welcome. Pull up the mic. Pull up the mic, okay. Uh, just want to apologize for being late. We no got problem. went it over in our prayer time, but uh, we want to thank you for reading the proclamation. And uh, we're just grateful to the council and to the mayor for allowing us to have this opportunity uh, to celebrate Juneteenth, the 150th celebration, uh, September Park this, this coming Friday. And uh, we're just grateful for the opportunity to promote diversity and educate Sioux Falls on a little bit of our history. So uh, we just want to say thank you for that. We really appreciate you being here and uh, making sure that everyone in our town knows about the celebration. Keep going. <laughs> yes, it's going to be a great time. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. your comments. Okay, bless you. Folks, anybody else want to engage the, uh, the council on, on any topic? Very good. Thank you so much for those comments. We certainly appreciate those. We're gonna, before we move on to our regular agenda, there were three items that uh, the council wanted to discuss. The first one is uh, Councilor Stagers wanted to discuss Prairie Hills West Park <laughs> to award a bid um, for 469500 Yes. Councilor? Yeah, I guess one concern I had here was that we're spending a half a million dollars on a new park, which is nice, but we really don't know very much about it. And how many people are going to benefit from this park? Uh, that's the main question I have for Don Kearney. We're going to spend a half a million. How many are going to benefit? <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. Uh, I don't really have a good estimate for you. I know that a, a neighborhood uh, that has been calling uh, for several years of re requesting a park in that location, um, you know, moms that uh, would like a place to take their, their kids uh, in, in a safe place to recreate is really what we're, what we're after. Um, I would tell you that we try to have a planning goal of a park within a half mile of every residence so that people can walk or bike uh, to their neighborhood parks so that they can um, have their youth uh, football practices, <laughs> baseball practices, whatever it might be. And, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to give you a number. Okay. And just one final thing. Um, that's one concern I have <clears throat> is we do have an ordinance, you know, talking about we're supposed to have a park within, you said a half hour, wasn't it, of every home? It's, it's a planning goal. Yeah, a goal. Uh, but also at the same time, it seems to me that we should be talking about how many people are actually going to be benefiting from this instead of just focusing on a half hour from somebody's home, you know, to find out are we going to have, you know, several thousand people benefiting from this or not. Because you take a look at the city parks today, there are many city parks that are very empty, that are not being used very much, and we should be focusing a lot of attention on getting those up to speed and and having them um, uh, uh, be uh, successful in providing opportunities for lots of kids. Councilor, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, yes, <laughs> Councilor Kiley. I would like to address that. There we go. I'd like to address that a little bit because I'm a huge proponent of the the neighborhood parks, um, and I I would hate to get into a position where we're judging. This neighborhood is eligible and they're deserving, but this neighborhood is not. Because even if there's one child over here, why should they be discriminated against if just because there's maybe 10,000 over here? And I know that that's an extreme example there, but I think there is a great benefit to the community with having the parks uh, spread evenly throughout the city. And, and, and I, I support this measure. Councilor, thank you. Move. Would you want to make a motion, Councilor Kelly? Move to approve. Second. There's been a motion to approve this item. It has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. 
Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. <clears throat> uh, then there was a second item by Councilor Anderson Jr. Entertainment venue slash Washington Pavilion. Washington Pavilion building improvements re roofing uh, in the amount of $1,230,455. Mr. Lowell, welcome. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair, members of the Council, uh, if I could Please. have a privilege, uh, when Craig got up, he talked about the pavilion and the fact that people don't have access. Uh, we have three sponsors uh, SDN, First Premier Bank, and, and Bank Card, and Shoneman's. They provide access on every free first Friday to get people into the Science Center and on the in the Visual Arts Center we have free Saturdays, free Tuesdays and uh, uh, along with the free first Friday. So there, there are, we've got some great sponsors that have stepped forward to help us do that. But uh, the Mr. issue Olvia, hand the is... questions in regard to the re-roofing. Yes. Uh, if you could keep your comments to that, we'd appreciate I, it. I should have done that in my, in your invitation. Uh, the roof was put on in 1997. It had a 10-year guarantee and a 15-year life. Here we are 18 years later, and the roof has significant problems. Uh, we've been fighting leaks for a number of years, uh, and I think the issue really gets down to when you understand that the roofing bid that you're looking at not only includes the roof, but uh, hail damage that we experienced last year. The third piece of the bid that is about $276,000 is in fact to repair the parapets that have been, are about 40 to 50 years old that cover the areas that are in copper and that piece was damaged during the hailstorm. The city has got a uh, uh, insurance payment. It does not come near to that. So if you look at the two pieces, really the roof what we're most concerned about is a bid of about um, eight, there was $861,924 in the, the budget. The base bid for the lower roof was 682 and the for the higher roof, which is over the Mary W. Somerville Hall at 682000 was higher than what we had in the budget of uh, to cover that, obviously. And so there was $92,000 difference in that. We have taken, we believe the roof replacement at the pavilion is one of the most important things we can do. Uh, I used to manage real estate in my former life, and I always knew that the roof would leak over the most expensive piece of communications equipment or over the president's desk. And uh, we have significant <clears throat> leaks in a variety of places, but fortunately it's not over the co-president's desk, but we've had it everywhere else. Uh, so we're, we're taking projects out of OSEP uh, and putting that into this to be able to do the roof. The issue about the parapets is still open because uh, city engineering is dealing with the insurance company to see if there's more money there than what they originally gave the city. Uh, I believe the, the amount they gave the city was 80 some thousand for that and we are obviously at 276 so there's some things going on there. The roof is as you know, we, we've replaced the windows. We have retuck pointed the building. It's a very old building. Getting the roof done is, in our mind, critical to sealing the building and at least minimizing the problems. But I'd answer any questions. Mr. Toll, thank you so much. Uh, Councilor Anderson, Jr., did you, before I go, did you have any questions for uh, Larry? No, I just wanted this to be an informational. Very it good. is a public building. It's a, it's a huge expense, but I wanted them to know why. Thank you. Thank you. Would you want to make a motion on this item? I will. I'll move for approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Urbanbach. Any, yes, uh, Councilor Karski. Yes, thank you. Mr. Toll, you mentioned that the current roof had a 10-year <clears throat> warranty, 15-year life expectancy. What is this roof going to have? Um, that's a really good question. I'm familiar with putting on membrane roofs. This roof that we're putting on is uh, will be adhered to the, the wood versus the one today, which is laid down and then covered with rock. So it should be, uh, I believe it's going to be 25 year, but I, I'd have to, if you'd like, I'd get back to you to ensure. Email would be nice. I will, Thank you. I will do that.
Thank you. Councillor Erickson. I'm just curious, are the balustrades going to be uh, replaced as well on there? Is, are we just talking the roof? I mean, what other areas? It's, it's it, the high, high roof over that you see from a distance, the part that sticks up that covers the Somerville Hall, is that will be replaced and then everything else on the top. The Cynodome roof, if you recall, was replaced last year. So we really have the building, I think, in, in excellent shape. And uh, you know, we continue to work to preserve the outside because the building envelope is always the most important thing. You, you can do things inside the building, but if they're going to get wandered damaged, then uh, it's not worthwhile doing. So that's why we want to forego some projects to ensure that the roof is done. A Rokovo, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is base pass eight to zero. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your stewardship also, Mr. Phil. Appreciate that. The third item was uh, by Council Erpenbach. It involves highways and streets, 2015 bridge inspection program agreement for engineering services in the amount of 15795 Council Erpenbach. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It is just a housekeeping issue. It, um, we need to uh, have a motion to approve it, and then we'll amend it just to fix some wording in it. So I would make appreciate a motion, motion to approve. Second. Carson. Councilors, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Councilor, did you have a motion to amend? Yeah. Um, I'd like to make a motion to amend the item and include Project uh, 11014 and the change bridge inspection program to bridge rehabilitation. I would second that, Mr. Mayor. Councilors, thank you both on that amendment. Uh, if there's no discussion, we'll vote on the amendment. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. The amendment is passed. We'll now vote on the amended motion. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Thank you, Council, for cleaning that up. We appreciate it. Uh, item 23. All right. 23 is transfer of a 2015 retail wine license from Tokyo Japanese Cuisine LLC, Tokyo Japanese Cuisine 4825 South Louise Avenue to New Tokyo Japanese Cuisine LLC, New Tokyo Japanese Cuisine 4825 South Louise Avenue, full service restaurant, CUP not required. 24 is transfer of a 2415 retail malt beverage license from Tokyo Japanese Cuisine LLC, Tokyo Japanese Cuisine, 4825 South Louise Avenue, to New Tokyo Japanese Cuisine LLC, New Tokyo Japanese Cuisine, 4825 South Louise Avenue, full service restaurant, CUP not required. 25 renewal of 2015 16 retail malt beverage license for New Tokyo Japanese Cuisine LLC, New Tokyo Japanese Cuisine, 4825 South Louise Avenue. 26, transfer of 2015 retail wine license from Tokyo Japanese Restaurant LLC, Tokyo Japanese Restaurant, 109 East 10th Street to New Tokyo Japanese Restaurant LLC, New Tokyo Japanese Restaurant, 109 East 10th Street, full service restaurant, CUP not required. 27, transfer of a 2014-15 retail <coughs> malt beverage license from Tokyo Japanese Restaurant LLC, Tokyo Japanese Restaurant, 109 East 10th Street, to New Tokyo Japanese Restaurant, LLC, New Tokyo Japanese Restaurant, 109 East 10th Street, full service restaurant, CUP not required. Item 28, renewal of a 2015-16 retail malt beverage license for New Tokyo Japanese Restaurant, LLC, New Tokyo Japanese Restaurant, 109 East 10th Street. And 29, transfer of a 2015 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales certificate and video lottery terminals from Paul Saxton, Bog Trotters Pub, Grub and Tap, 201 East 11th Street, to Shane Haven Hospitality, LLC. Bog Trotters Irish Pub, Grub and Tap, 201 East 11th Street. With the conditional use permit, 2012-11-15, being approved on January 9, 2013. Jamie, welcome. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. Thanks for reading all that, Lori. <laughs> A little tongue twister for you. <laughs> um, items 23 through 25 um, are all for the same business. The two transfers must um, occur before we can renew the retail malt beverage. 26 through 28, again, are for the same business. The transfers must occur before the renewal can occur. And item 29 is um, a transfer of uh, a license from an, a single owner to an LLC. So. Jamie, thank you. Councilors, any comments, motions? Move to approve, Erpenbach. Second, Kylie. Councilor Erpenbach, uh, thank you for that. Councilor Kylie, thank you as well. A roll call vote, please. 
All right, Council Members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 30. <clears throat> 30 is first reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city, amending the fees subchapter of chapter 95, Parks and Recreation. Welcome, Tracy. Good evening, Mayor Council, Tracy Turbeck with the Finance Office. I'll kick things off here tonight on this, this uh, agenda item. This ordinance uh, it will establish the rates to be charged for use of our new indoor aquatic center, and it will also set rates uh, to be charged for the use of our existing outdoor aquatics facilities. Now, uh, as you know, we, we gave a, uh, a presentation a week ago to the council at an informational, and tonight we uh, had just have an uh, abbreviated version of that presentation again for, for you folks as well as the, the viewing public. I do want to uh, kick things off and recap the goals uh, that we established as we uh, began the process of pre uh, preparing this uh, ordinance. Um, first and foremost, one of the goals we set was to establish rates that do recognize the value of the facilities to all of our citizens. It's clear that uh, our current outdoor rates that are, are charged here in Sioux Falls are significantly below other South Dakota communities. In fact, even with the $1 uh, bump in the daily rates that is being recommended, uh, we will still be uh, well below the South Dakota average. and. Uh, I believe that provides a great bargain to our uh, swimming public. The, uh, the recommended rates are not intended to get us to that break-even point. I know somebody mentioned earlier this concept of uh, setting rates at a level that uh, equates to the full cost of providing that service. That is not the intent with the, uh, the, the uh, proposed rates for our outdoor facility. Uh, we are recommending what I believe is a very reasonable and balanced approach to share the burden uh, of operating our aquatics facilities between the users of the facilities and the taxpayers in general. And I believe the, the recommended uh, ordinance that you have before you is, uh, will achieve that. Uh, operating our aquatics facilities is not inexpensive. I mentioned to you last week that uh, in 2014, we spent $1.8 million operating our outdoor aquatics facilities. And uh, we'll have a slide in a minute that, that provides a little more background on that and how those costs are shared. It's important, I think, to keep in mind, I know you folks understand this, but it's also important, I think, for others that are uh, watching and, and listening <coughs> on, uh, to this particular topic that those expenses that are not covered by user fees are paid by taxes. Those are covered by the taxes that we pay. Tax dollars that we spend to operate our aquatics facilities are dollars that are not available then to hire police officers, to grow our fire department, to fix potholes, fund affordable housing programs, run libraries, or care for our parks or other recreational facilities. All of those things that I just mentioned are funded out of that same pot of tax dollars that we will utilize to fill that gap on our aquatics facilities for whatever the uh, fees, user fees do not cover. It is just critically important, in my view, to keep up with rates. Uh, falling further and further behind is just simply not a prudent approach. The city clearly went down that path a number of years ago with utility rates and only recently emerged from that quite painful process uh, after multiple years with very large, very difficult increases in water and sewer rates. And I would urge the council to work with us to find a way to get on a more prudent path than what we're on with our aquatics rates. Increasing rates, I understand, uh, is never easy. It's, it's difficult, uh, but it is the right approach. It's the prudent thing to do. Now, considering the uh, indoor facility, uh, that, will, that facility will take us into some uncharted territory. We don't have one of those now, so we, there's a lot of things that we don't know about what it will involve in terms of the operations. Uh, so we'll, we expect to learn a lot the first year of operations with our new facility. Uh, for example, we'll learn who is using the facility, how are they using it, when are they using it, what do they prefer, what areas of the facility are most used, who's not using the facility and why. 
So we, we have, I believe, an awful lot to learn in terms of our indoor facility. And for those reasons, we've deliberately kept things simple for this first year in terms of the recommended rates for the indoor aquatics facility. I like to refer to, the, refer to that as the crawl, walk, run approach. Let's, let's take a first step, keep it relatively simple, and learn what we can learn that first year, and then we can uh, reevaluate after that first year with uh, greater analysis. Some of you may refer to that as the, the KISS principle. At any rate, that's the, uh, the introduction I have to kind of cover the goals that we were trying to achieve. And uh, Don Kearney will now take you through the, the highlights on the recommended rates for the both outdoor and indoor aquatics facilities. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, our outdoor aquatic facility rates uh, are as follows. Um, proposed outdoor daily rates, uh, as you see in red, Sioux Falls is noted there in our proposed rates. Uh, we are proposing for a child of $4 for a daily admission, $5 for adults, and $4 for seniors. You'll note, uh, as Tracy mentioned earlier, that uh, our rates compared to the South Dakota average for outdoor facilities uh, is below the South Dakota average uh, by a considerable amount, and that uh, we're pretty close to what other Midwestern communities charge. And so the proposed daily rates we think are very reasonable uh, compared to what other cities charge. The other thing we wanted to share with you and just remind you of what we're proposing is our outdoor season pass rates. As you can see, uh, with Sioux Falls being on the far left column, our proposed rate at over the three year phase in would go to $60 for a child, $70 for an adult, $65 for a senior, $150 for a family, and $75 for a reduced family. And there were no comparables for uh, the reduced family with the other cities we surveyed. You'll note also that we also have a color-coded uh, bar for Sioux Falls. We are proposing it in three different years. Uh, 2016 represents the green bar. 2000, or excuse me, 2016 represents the green bar. 2017 represents uh, the blue bar. In 2018, uh, the final year of the proposed rate increase represents the red uh, portion of that bar. Uh, so you can see when we get completely done, uh, we are aligning ourselves very well with the South Dakota average and the Midwest average. And in the case of the Midwest average, we're, we're slightly below that. Now, now realize by the time we get to 2018, we are likely to fall behind further uh, because uh, the other cities are more than likely going to continue to the rate, raise their rates on a regular basis. Again, no other cities surveyed offer free or reduced passes. Our recommendation uh, as well is to discontinue the free passes, but we are still committed to affordable access with reduced season passes to qualified households at half the cost of a regular season pass. One of the things that came up in our uh, work session discussion uh, last Tuesday was, uh, I think Councilmember Anderson actually brought it up, I uh, thought it was a good idea, is that we have tremendous corporate support and community support for um, uh, helping with uh, uh, community needs such as free passes. And one of the things we uh, are, are committed to and feel confident that we can do in cooperation with the Council, the Park Board, is to find corporate sponsors to help us with free passes. Uh, we believe that's a, a good alternative uh, to try to accommodate some of those that maybe slip through the cracks. And um, the other thing I wanted to share with you too is that we currently use the United Way Connecting Kids program. Uh, every uh, elementary school aged child receives a voucher in their backpacks with, that they take home. And we are one of the partners with the United Way on the Connecting Kids program, along with many other organizations in the community that the United Way partners with. Uh, currently, uh, you can use your Connecting Kids uh, voucher for a fully funded swimming lesson or a fully funded youth band and summer singers program. You know, that's another example of an, uh, an avenue that we can pursue uh, through a grant application process. It's a competitive process, but we've talked to the United Way and they've indicated that we're certainly willing to, uh, uh, or, or, we're able to apply and, and vie for those dollars through the United Way. So that's another option that we've explored. 
So we really feel confident that we can um, get some private support to help us in that regard. One of the questions that came up uh, last Tuesday as well, and, and Tracy alluded to it, is that our outdoor pools in 2014 uh, cost about $1.8 million to operate. Uh, our current user fees, uh, actual user fees in 2014 amounted to $466,000, which represents 20%, 26% of the total uh, costs associated uh, with operating our outdoor facilities and $1.3 million was covered by the property taxpayers, or the taxpayers, I should say. Uh, we also have uh, a chart that shows if the 2016 proposed rates go into effect, what that would do. Uh, again, the dollar amount is about $1.7 million. Based on the first year of uh, proposed increases, it would cover 42% of the total cost of operating these facilities and the, the general tax support would consist of right at a million dollars. At full uh, realization of the three-year phase-in plan, that number uh, would go from, <coughs> in 2018, would be about 53% supported through user fees and 47% supported through general tax support. So we've kind of shifted that uh, based on our proposed rate structure. Now onto our proposed indoor aquatic center rates. As you'll see, our proposed child rate for daily admission is five, adults are $6, and seniors are $5. You'll see that we're a um, dollar and two dollars lower than the South Dakota average as it relates to outdoor facilities. And we say outdoor facilities because there really weren't very good comparables in the state of South Dakota that we could really use to be able to compare it to indoor facilities in South Dakota. But for reference purposes, we did include the outdoor numbers. Uh, we also did talk to uh, other Midwest indoor aquatic center providers that are municipally operated. Uh, and you'll notice that our rates are um, uh, slightly above what they're proposing. But again, um, we think are very reasonable. We do have a couple other options for uh, admission to our indoor aquatic center as proposed. Um, we are proposing a discounted indoor punch pass rate. Uh, it's basically a transferable uh, pass that you can use uh, to use for daily admission. Um, for example, uh, the proposed rate is a 10% reduction in what the daily rate would be. So for example, if you wanted to buy $100 worth of credit, uh, we would charge you $90 for that credit and give you $10 uh, off of that $100 punch pass. Uh, another example, uh, for those that qualify for the reduced rate, they would receive a 50% savings off the face value of that credit. So if they were to, wanted to buy a $100 punch pass, uh, $100 worth of credit, they would uh, only pay $50 for that. We do have a third option. We, we thought there might be some hardcore swimmers uh, that would want to use this facility. Maybe it's a lap swimmer, maybe it's a water walker that are going to go three, four, five times a, a week. Uh, we wanted to have an option for them as well. Uh, or maybe it's just a, a child that lives in the neighborhood is just going to be there all the time. And so uh, we did uh, identify an individual pass at $300 for the entire year to use the indoor aquatic center. Then again, we also have the reduced rate of uh, $150 or half of the cost of the, of the regular price pass. So we have a variety of different options. And the nice thing about the punch pass system is that it has great flexibility. If I want to use it or I want to give it to my neighbor kid, he can use it as well. And so it's got transferability, great flexibility. You can have any denomination that you want. If you want to buy, oh, I shouldn't say any, we did put a $20 minimum on it so that you, we weren't given $5 increments out. Uh, but we think there's going to be a very good uh, opportunity to really gauge the interest in this facility, see what, as Tracy alluded to, how are people using it, who is using it, uh, and really uh, start out slow, very simple, and then we can tweak it as we go along. We'll learn a lot in that first year. We also compared our race with other local aquatic facilities. Um, we also said, okay, what would it take to, to use the indoor aquatic center uh, based on an individual monthly rate. Uh, based on the reduced rates, uh, it would be $13. Based on the regular rate, it would be $25. And so the individual monthly rate 
uh, as it relates to other aquatic facilities in Sioux Falls, ranges anywhere from $30 up to $72. Now we realize they're not apples to apples comparisons, but it, it, one of the things we heard over and over again is that we wanted uh, good, reasonable, affordable access to, to lap swimming, to water walking, uh, to more options for aquatics. And based on these rates, uh, we believe that it'll be a good opportunity for be able to have that access they've been asking for. We also compared our uh, costs to, for a family of five. What would it take for a family of five to use the indoor aquatic center? Based on our uh, proposed punch pass system, it would be $14 for a family of five. For the regular price pass, uh, it would be 24. And then we also showed, you know, what does it uh, cost to use some of these other uh, entertain, in, entertainment venues here we, that we have here in town, many of which are supported by the city such as the Butterfly House, the Zoo, Century Movie Theater, Pavilion, and Great Bear Tubing Hill. You know, it does, it gives you a, a really good idea that this is gonna be an affordable option compared to some of the options that are out there for entertainment dollars. Uh, as a reminder, uh, goals for our aquatics work rates were to ensure outstanding value for all citizens, align our outdoor rates with other South Dakota and comparable Midwest communities, establish rates for our new indoor aquatic center, and provide a high quality patron experience. At the end, when we get done, we, we feel confident we'll be able to offer a safe, affordable, accessible, and most importantly, a fun experience for everybody involved. A reminder about the timeline, uh, we did meet with all three committees of our Parks and Recreation Board earlier this month. Uh, we did meet with council leadership. As you know, we were uh, before the city council last Tuesday at your informational. Uh, I am able to report tonight that the Parks and Recreation Board did meet and they did take action. Uh, they approved the proposed indoor aquatic center uh, fee structure as, as we've outlined it here but uh, deferred action on the outdoor rates uh, with the idea that they would like a little bit more information, a little more time to digest it. However, we will uh, come back to you with the park board's recommendation on the outdoor rates um, prior to your July 7th, or at your July 7th second reading. And so they just want a little more time on the outdoor rates, but they did uh, unanimously approve the proposed indoor rates. So with that, our team is ready and able to answer your questions. Tracy and Don, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Uh, Council, uh, any questions, comments, motions? Councilor Jamison. Thank you, uh, Don. Question on the uh, swim, <coughs> proposed swim rates for uh, lane rentals and uh, league fees mm -hmm. for uh, per team. Did you, how did you find those numbers? Where'd you come up with those from, for the indoor pool? Yeah, those are based on comparing our, uh, actually looking at rates of what other similar size facilities uh, charge, similar indoor aquatics facilities, and those are based on the average rates of what other communities charge. Okay, and then if I could, a uh, no, couple other things. The uh, process for approving individuals for the free and reduced passes, or free pass free passes, I guess, not the reduced. Uh, I understand that there's probably been some fraud and uh, other issues that you challenges you've had for approving those and wound up with a lot of kids with those passes. Uh, uh, have you considered or looked at other options to revamping that program, retooling it to uh, fix some of those problems versus eliminating it? Well, I think uh, we're, we're in a really good situation as it relates to uh, people going out and getting uh, duplicate passes, people putting passes on Craigslist, those types of things with our new point of sale system. We've been able to really curtail that. Um, however, at this point, uh, we've not looked at another mechanism for uh, qualifying individuals for those reduced or free rates. So, um, but, so the answer is no on, on other alternatives at this point. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor, thank you. Any other questions? If not, would anybody want to make a motion to set it? Yeah, very good, Councilor Bach. Thank you, um, Don. This is something that's weighing on me since last week. Do we know what percentage of the city budget is covered by pool entrance fees? 
I don't, but maybe Tracy does. Tracy, Councilor Bach asked, uh, what percentage of the pool? But, so don't go anywhere, Don. Just I, I want you to think of it in 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 a bigger picture then, because one of the communities you talked about that we compared ourselves to was Yankton and some other smaller towns in South Dakota. I'd like to see a comparison. What's the percentage of the Yankton city budget that's covered by their pool <coughs> entrance fees? And what's the percentage <coughs> of entrance fees that cover are, are covered in our budget? I, I, think it's, I think it's a valid point when we talk about how much money we're talking about here in the grand scheme of things. So something to think about before the next, if you can't pull it off the top of your head, I know it's some, but. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilor, would you mind, uh, or would anybody mind sending a data hearing and second Councilor reading? Councilor Erickson for, has a, something. Yeah, and we can certainly get to that too. Uh, I think Councilor, Councilor Erickson. I'll go ahead and make a motion. Uh, my motion is um, to actually defer this. Uh, for the second reading to not be heard until October 6th. My reasoning behind that is, is this is Councilor been, Erickson, would you just make the motion? Sorry, let motion. somebody second it. Sorry. sorry. Second that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, and I'll go Councilor, on. Councilor, could you make your motion first? Yes. I'll Thank make you. a motion to defer the second reading until October 6th, 2015. Second. Yes. And I second that. Thank you. Now, what I, what I want to focus on is a couple different things. We... We as a council have been offered to meet with staff and I have a meeting as well as some of us have meetings on um, this coming Friday to discuss some of the details of this. I feel for me personally, our park system is a jewel. We, I sat in on some brainstorming. Our pools are fantastic and that's okay. That's great. We should celebrate that and we should encourage people to attend it and not just um, I say it carefully, not just increase the fees. And I know that it's been um, deliberated. I know this hasn't been taken lightly, um, but I feel that we need more time to look at this. Uh, we need more time to study it. Um, we need more time to really um, iron out some of the, the details of it. There are options. There's options for free and reduced. It might not be a perfect program, but we can fix it. And I'm confident that if we put our heads together, we can fix it. Um, I think we owe it to um, those citizens that can't afford it to be able to uh, have the accessible fun in our community. Um, so that's, I could go on and on and on, um, but I look forward to continuing the conversations. I do agree that we probably do need to increase prices a little bit, um, not at a rate of 400% over the next three years. Um, if, if I was in the insurance industry, I probably wouldn't have a job if I increased somebody's insurance rate for 400% over three years. We just need to take a, a little bit more of a careful look at this. Um, and, and really make sure that we're engaging the citizens for this particular thing. Thank you. And I'd encourage my colleagues to please uh, vote to defer this. Councilor Kale. Thank you. Um, I, I too had expressed a number of questions and some reservations last week and, um, and we unfortunately have not had the chance to have that kind of dialogue. So I, I do believe that uh, delaying this so that we can thoroughly discuss this uh, would be appropriate. The, and as I mentioned last week, and I'd like to state it again, I don't think there's anything wrong. And in this case, I, I do know that there's, there's, you've stated there are not other communities that offer free, free passes to the pools. And, and, I'm, and I also stated last week that I'm not opposed to rate increases, especially for individuals in, in my category. But uh, for some of the individuals that are struggling to make decisions on, do I pay the rent or do I buy groceries or kids' clothes, uh, I, I, I do have reservations there. And I think that maybe we should look at it a little differently, that we have a model that other communities should aspire to. And so I, I just welcome the opportunity for further dialogue on this topic. Councilor. <coughs> October 6, I don't know if there's a magic to that date, but I, I do understand the need and the desire to talk more about this whole um, process, and de delaying it probably is a good idea. We're not talking about a significant impact to our budget. I mean, 
in reality, when we got a $400 million budget, we're talking about uh, three or $400,000. It's, it's negligible. And I, I agree, um, Councillor Erickson, if I was in the rental property business and I raised rental rates 400%, I probably would, probably would lose a lot of tenants too. So I, <laughs> I, I will support that. Councillor Mbach. Mr. Mayor, to address your comments to the chair over here, the October 6th does have a magic date. It's after we pr approve the budget, so it makes no changes to the existing program so that we can just, we don't need to set indoor pool rates at this time. We don't have an indoor pool to set rates for. And I think it's the feeling of the council, and Councilor Erickson has, has expressed it very well, that it does not have to be rushed, that we can spend some time talking about this and deal with it after the 2016 budget has been approved, and I agree with the councilor. Councillor Jameson. Just a couple of points. The uh, budget implications, uh, I do agree that Tracy does need numbers to yes. plug into the budget as projections. <coughs> they don't change. We don't change. <coughs> but but as, as you are articulating, right, he can include the current numbers and use the projections, and if changes need to be made, we can adjust the budget. I don't think it'll be um, overly uh, complicated to do that. One other issue I wanted to talk about is that I think the counselors probably have an indication to raise rates a little bit, maybe uh, come up with our own numbers, reinstitute the free passes for those who qualify under a new program. But what's complicated about it is that we're going to have a whole new list of prices, and we'll have to amend the reading in order to do that. And after we make our motion to approve it and then amend it, we won't have time for the public to come back and engage us in public input. So once we come up with our plan, we can actually get some feedback from the public on what we want to do versus what's been proposed. I think we've all gotten the earful from the public on the proposed rates, but without our recommended revisions, the public won't have a chance to respond. So I think this time is going to give us a chance to weigh that out there and get some response. So. Thank you. Tracy, Don, any comments in regards to the budget? If you, anything? Yeah, I can, I can try to uh, address kind of the implications of delaying that. The, uh, of course, the charter requires the mayor to present his proposed operating budget uh, next month. This council has, the past council had established a, a policy that we live by that says if we're going to put revenues in the budget, that they have to be adopted by the council before that budget is, pre is presented to the council. So the implication of, of doing nothing then is that we will project rates in the budget for the outdoor aquatics facilities at their current level, <coughs> and we will project no revenues for the indoor facility. And that's those two amounts uh, based on the increases that were recommended and what we're proposing for the indoor rates amount to about $400,000. The costs have to be in the budget. The cost of operating the indoor facility for the, the three or four months at the end of next year will have to be in the budget. So those costs are going to have to be covered uh, by some other means, either uh, reductions in other areas that might otherwise take place. Uh, some other revenue source maybe that we haven't even thought of yet, but I don't anticipate that happening. So it will have a $400,000 impact to the proposed budget that you see. <clears throat> Those will be uh, lower expenditure recommendations in other areas of the budget. So it will have an impact. Councilor Mark. Tracy, did not the council approve the existing rates for aquatics facilities in the city of Sioux Falls? Did the council approve the existing rates? They're in ordinance. Mm -hmm. And if we don't change that ordinance, does it not stand then? Can, can those rates not just apply to all pools, whether they're indoor or outdoor? My, my understanding is no, that we don't, we don't have rates for an indoor facility today. I, that, that seems like, that's, yeah, that's squishy ground for me. I, I, I think you've got pools, and, and we, we define it as a an, as an, uh, family aquatic center. I just read the ordinance without the changes to it. It's defined as a family aquatic center. It's four months. It's, uh, 
I think we're really stretching here. And, and you know, and frankly, it's, it's concerning to me that we're trying to make it so scary, because it's not. This is, this is Councilor Rolfing's right, this is about us setting a standard that's different than other communities. We can be different, and it's really okay to just set, leave the rates the way they are and just run with it, regardless of what kind of pool it is. It's okay to leave those rates the way they are for a little while. In, in any regard, even if you use those rates, you would have very minimal revenues at that level. So, I, I mean, it's uh, <coughs> from a budgetary standpoint, whether that ordinance applies to the indoor facility or not is really uh, not going to have a significant impact on the budget. I, I mean, there, we will be budgeting for costs that we had, an, had uh, at least up until today, had anticipated would be funding. We would be funding with revenues that now will not be uh, in the budget. Councilor. Could, the, uh, could Dave give us a quick opinion on whether the swing rates apply to indoor and outdoor or just outdoor? Yeah. Well, Councilor, uh, based on a, uh, without a lot of time for review, in terms of what Family Aquatic Center is currently defined, it says it's located at the following parks, Drake Springs, Laurel, Oak, and Terrace Park. So that is fairly limiting language. So I think the interpretation Tracy is offering is probably the more accurate one. Good question. Councilor Erickson. We're talking about 2016, three months. How is three months, I, I guess I'm not understanding where we're coming up with $400,000 for three months of an indoor aquatic center. Tracy, could you explain that budget process to Councilor Erickson, please? It's not that I don't understand the budget operating process. That's not my point, but I'm, no, why not add a little in there? Why not, I mean, we're, we're talking about just setting the fees for the indoor aquatic center. We're not talking about much more than that. We're talking about four months for the indoor aquatic center. So fill me in there where you can help me understand better, please. Thank you. The, that, that's correct. You, are, you would be delaying the implementation <laughs> fees for the indoor center, which amounts uh, for that four months would be about $150,000. There's another $250,000 that would be generated by the proposed increases to the outdoor facility rates. So that's how we get to four hundred thousand dollars. Councillor Kiley. Um, actually, I, I wanted to ask uh, Councillor Jamison for a clarification of his previous statement because I wasn't quite following your intention with that, and and then I have an additional thought. Councillor Jamison. Thanks for the opportunity. I'll try it. <clears throat> the idea is that. Just like now, if this were the second reading after we've made our amendment, like we're probably likely to do to adjust the rates, there would be no public input. And so we would, ha we would have no way to ga gauge the public's reaction to our proposed changes. And I would like to have the public's input, and if we somehow provide it in, a, in another fashion or at another time, we'll have that chance to get the public's opinion. That's just a thought. Councilor Kiley. And I, and I guess my additional thought was if we did not follow through with Councilor Erickson's amendment, but rather we don't pass this tonight, it then will come back as a first reading again at a later date, it, providing us time for further dialogue, and then a second reading again, and it get, provides us with the transparency that you're addressing as well. Councilor Erickson. I would be fine with that. Um, another solution, if we are concerned about not having rates set for the indoor aquatic centers, we can redefine it in ordinance next month. Um, we, can, we can say it's covered for both indoor and outdoor, and there is still um, a shortfall of what they are pro proposing at this time. But that doesn't mean that we can't have it fixed or amended or changed by October. Uh, many of us had, have had most of the, the concern about the outdoor and having time to vet that um, process a little bit more. And so redefining it, there's a solution right there. We have options. Uh, Councilor Erbach. And I agree. I'm just looking again at the ordinance. If we just change the definition of a family aquatic center to take out the word outdoor in leisure pool and take out the sentence, um, take out the sentence, aquatic centers are located at the Falling Parks, Drake, Laurel, and Terrace, that 
that does it for us. We can't do it tonight, obviously, but what I'm hearing the whole group say is that we're not okay with making this change this fast, that we need to, to find some other way to do this. And I guess, however you guys, I'm fine with killing it. Are, do you want to vote it. on your motion, Councilor Erickson, or would you want us yeah, to remove would, your motion? No, nope, I would and go start ahead over. and vote with the motion and okay. I will work to change the ordinance um, definition. There's been a motion to change the date of second reading for October, Six. October 6, 2015. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Item number 31. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending planning public notification signage fees. Diane, oh, sorry. Excuse me. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Diane DeCoyer with the Planning Office. The applicant for this is the City of Sioux Falls, the Planning and Building Services Office. Um, this proposal is to amend the fees for both the rezoning and conditional use permit applications. The fee increase of $75 for conditional use permits and $150 for rezoning applications. With passage of House Bill 1195 by South Dakota legislature earlier this year, the size of the required signs posted on the property for the applications has increased from 11 by 14 to 24 by 18. There's a significant increase in the cost of printing the new signs, um, hence the increase of cost for signs. I can answer any questions you have. Diane, thank you very much. Uh, Council, any questions? <clears throat> Move to set the date of hearing. Second, Anderson. It's been a, a motion to set a date of uh, second reading for Tuesday, July 7th, has been seconded. A roll call, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? That is passed 8 to 0, <laughs> item 32. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property west of North Weber Avenue, north of East 10th Street, and south of East 3rd Street from the I 1 Light Industrial and C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar Districts to the DTPUD Downtown Plan Unit Development District, petition number 2543-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Thank you. The applicant for this, again, is the City of Sioux Falls Planning oh. Office. Um, the size of the area within um, the downtown PUD that we're proposing is 27.66 acres. Um, the purpose is to bring those properties into the downtown planned unit development. These were properties that should have been brought in when shape places took effect, but they weren't, so we're doing it at this time as, as a cleanup. Um, we did have some questions at Planning Commission after the meeting, some residents that didn't quite understand what the rezone was. Um, we hope to get in touch with those by second reading so that we can have a neighborhood meeting to clarify any questions they have. Diane, thank you. Councilors, any questions on this? Yes, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Can you go back to the first uh, drawing, please, Diane? Can you go back to that first drawing? This one? That one. Uh, so now, right now, I'm looking at the eastern border here. Is right. it Nesmith, or is it through the middle of those properties, especially those residentials between 6th and 3rd Street? Um, the outline is, um, the de defined line is actually on North Weber Avenue, so everything west of Weber Avenue, so it doesn't contain any residential properties. Okay, I was looking at that outside circle. Then. Right, and that's just our area that we have to send notification, that 300-foot boundary. So there were residential properties that were notified, but none that are included in the rezone. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Move to set the second reading for Tuesday, July 7th, 2015. Second. second. Well, it's been a motion and has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council <laughs> members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Dennis Fassi to zero item 33. 
First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 504 South McNally Avenue from the RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban District to the I-1 Light Industrial District, petition number 2709-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Again, the location is 504 South McNally Avenue. The size of the parcel is 0.45 acres. The purpose is to continue to use the property for storage and construct a new 14 by 32 storage shed. <clears throat> um, the property has been used for storage since the house was demoed in 2005. It had been previously zoned as I-1 light industrial, um, but has been designated as R2, which is a townhome designation under shape places. Um, a buffer yard should be required to the west where the property is zoned RS. Um, on the other three sides of the property, the parcels are zoned as I-1 light industrial. If the property is not approved for rezoning, it will remain as a non-conforming parcel. Diane, thank you. Council, any questions? Move to sec set the second reading date for July 7th. Second. There's been a motion. It's been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Rothing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? That is passed 8 to 0, <laughs> item 34. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property west of South Infield Avenue and south of East 41st Street from the AG Agriculture District to the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District, petition number 2729 2015 and amending the official zoning map of the city of sioux falls planning commission recommends approval the applicant for this is justin oakland it's located south of east 41st street and east of south highway uh, 11. the size is one acre the purpose is to construct three twin homes the rezone provides a good transition from the existing rd1 twin home zoning on the south and west to the existing RS single family to the east. If the rezone is not approved, the parcel will continue to be zoned ag and could be used for a detached farm dwelling or agricultural use as it is. And I can answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Diane. Any questions, council? Move to set the second reading for Tuesday, July 7th, 2015. Second. It's been a motion. It's been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rothing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That's pass 8 to 0, <laughs> item 35. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 504 and 604 South Hillview Road from the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District to the C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District, petition number 2341-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls, Planning Commission recommends approval. The applicant for this is Bryant Soberg with Common Land 2. Um, again, it's located at 504 and 604 South Hillview Road, which is south of East Arrowhead Parkway and west of South Foss Avenue. The size of the area for the rezone is 1.75 acres. The purpose is to construct for commercial development. A level C buffer yard is required on the south and west side of the property. The north and east sides are adjacent to commercial property, therefore buffer yards are not required. Access will not be allowed to Arrowhead Parkway, but will be allowed at Hillview and Foss. Um, a, traffic, a traffic impact study will be required before a building permit is allowed. Neighbors have expressed some concern about traffic from the development entering into the neighborhood to the south. With potential exiting of vehicles um, from the development at night onto Hillview, um, the fear is that there's headlights that may shine into some of the neighbors' homes to the west and be disruptive to those families. And I can answer any questions you might have. Diane, thank you. Uh, Councilor Jameson. Diane, could you go back to the map that maybe, there you go. Help me uh, understand exactly how that would lay out and where those cars would go. You said go on to Foss? There would be access to Foss Avenue? I'm going to skip over to their concept plan here so you can see where the parking is. I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. But there is access where it says proposed shared full access. That would get them out onto South Foss Avenue, which is that entrance to Walmart and also the stoplight at Arrowhead Parkway. Um, the other access they would have is all the way to the west, and that would be Hillview. 
and across on the west side of Hillview there is where there's residential homes. Okay, thank you. Councilor uh, Rolfing. Yes, a um, couple of things. I know that you had talked a little bit, or last time they had talked about possibly uh, moving this around a little bit, uh, moving these things. I can see right now that that big box kind of thing could be moved to the east and the parking on the, on the west, and the driveway could be moved um, could be moved uh, farther north to, to alleviate that problem. You see um, what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you look back, you know, if they move it to the north, they would still be facing into some residential homes there on the west side. So you may still have the problem, but certainly we can propose that to the applicant. We well, can they, but you that. would, yeah, you'd be into the, into the one house instead of maybe four houses there. So that would take care of some of that. If they, and I know they said they considered moving some of that, uh, of that casino end of it to a little <coughs> different location too. So I would encourage you to, um, uh, I have another question too, but I encourage you to sure. work with the developer and um, Mr. Berg to come to a suitable um, uh, design concept that everybody can live with. And can you explain to us what level C is? How um, tall level, the berm or the fence would be? Yeah, a level C is a 30 foot um, buffer yard. And in this case, my understanding from the applicant, the area that you see is in green there to the south. That is a 30 foot setback, that buffer yard. And it's about eight feet taller in elevation than what uh, the residential home is to the south. The yellow area that indicates 10 is actually an easement that the applicant is proposing to give the residential property to the south. They have access that way uh, for their driveway and getting back to their garage. That was um, an agreement that they came to with that. Okay. Councilor Anderson, Jr. <clears throat> When uh, looking at the options for this plan, uh, one of the things you stated earlier was that there's no access from Arrowhead Parkway. Right. Was, was there ever any discussion about access, about slow down lane or anything like that into this? Um, I don't know if the applicant asked for that directly, but the um, answer came back from the traffic engineer that we would not want to have access directly from Arrowhead Parkway. So they proceeded with their plan as you see it tonight. That's why I asked about a slowdown lane because that would not be directly. Right. So we can revisit that both with the engineer and the applicant. My concern is, is that we're using a, a very undeveloped uh, residential road right. to be the access point for a major development here. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Yep. Councilor Colley. Thank you. Um, and I believe the individual that had uh, spoke on this topic last week during public input, wasn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. um, and it indicated he wasn't opposed to the project, but was looking for solutions to some of his issues. And uh, right. um, do you feel, and, and I guess I've addressed this before, but do you feel that you can come up with solutions to, to meet his his requirements or desires? Um, I know that the applicant and the owners have met with the resident to the south there, trying to work something out, come to an agreement. Um, I don't know that anything has been resolved beyond this, but we'll certainly try to meet or encourage them to meet again before the second reading. Because I, I do recall one of his concerns was uh, traffic that would be leaving this new development uh, and heading to the west, the headlight glare into residents across the street. And, and since I don't know what the layout of the driveways to those private uh, residences is, what would the possibility, because the, 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 the berm and the separation is obviously on the development side and that doesn't, and you can't do that in the uh, exit. So um, what is the possibility uh, if the developer were willing to put up some uh, type of trees or something that could block headlights, you know, actually on the other, uh, on, on the other property owned by this gentleman? Yeah, and I think what we'll ask them to do as well is probably lay out the properties across the street there so we have a better idea of how that drive Because that wouldn't work if up. there's a driveway right there right. in line. So. Yeah. That was just one possible solution. Yep, yep, we'll definitely work with them on that. 
Councilors, would anybody want to set a uh, data hearing? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, uh, Councilor Jameson. Did that. Uh, second by Councilor Erpenbach. Any roll call, please. Council members Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. Jameson. Yes. Karski. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. Anderson. Yes. That's passed eight to zero. Item thirty six. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property east and west of North Pennsylvania Avenue and south of West 54th Street from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban and RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban Districts to the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban and RD2 Town Home Residential Suburban Districts, petition number 2454-2015, animating the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Thank you. The applicant is Richard Brake. Um, this is both east and west of North Pennsylvania Avenue and south of West 54th Street. Um, the area is 6.98 acres. The purpose is to construct twin homes and fourplexes. If the rezoning of this property is approved, the applicant can construct twin homes adjacent to the collector street, adjacent to the single family homes and fourplexes adjacent to the collector and along the drainage way. If the rezoning is not approved, the parcel will continue to be rezoned to RS single family along the collector and duplexes along the drainage way. I can answer any questions you have. Thank you, Diane. Councilor, Councilor Jameson. Thank you, Diane. Did I, did I hear you right? Did I, did I get a sense that the applicant doesn't really uh, aggressively pursuing the change that he's willing to live with the single family. Is that, did I hear you right? I'm sorry, help me. Um, I don't know that I stated that, but my understanding is, yeah, this works with a better transition to have the twin homes and duplexes with the RD1 rezone, rather than single family when you're up against West 54th Street as a collector. I see, <coughs> against 54th, I got you, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jameson, would you be willing to set a data hearing second reading for this item? Yes, I would. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. <coughs> a roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That's passed 8 to 0, item 37. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property west of South Sertoma Avenue and south of West Stony Creek Street from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District to the RD1 Twin <coughs> Home Duplex Residential Suburban District, petition number 2734-2015, animating the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Thank you. The applicant is Matt Schultz. The size of the parcel is 0.44 acres. The proposed RD1 zoning provides a good transition from the existing apartments to the north and existing office zoning to the east to the existing single family to the south and west. If the rezoning is denied, a single family home can be constructed. However, the parcel may continue to be vacant because this is a difficult uh, parcel to try to market. The lot is adjacent to apartments to the north and future office to the east. I can answer any questions you have. Thanks, Diane. Move to set second reading Tuesday, July 7, 2015. Second, Eric. It's been a motion has been seconded. Uh, roll call vote. Yes, uh, Councilor. I um, just want to see the Karski. overhead um, map of that one again, if you don't mind. The zoning? Is that the one? Yeah, that one. Back up one to the other map satellite map, air, aircraft map, whatever we want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Any roll call vote, please? Council Member Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That's passed 8 to 0, item 38. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Section 41008 regarding fees for public facility tickets. Good evening, Jim David, Legislative Operations Manager for the City Council. The proposed ordinance before you tonight was prompted by an April audit report that identified multiple issues with the public facility ticket fee ordinance. This is the fee that is applied to all city-owned sports and entertainment facility tickets that have a fixed seating of more than 2,500 persons. Specifically, the audit report recommended that the fee structure be simplified or allow operators discretion when working with promoters 
ensure there is no conflicting wording between agreements with operators in the ordinance, enforce or revise the wording in the ordinance that requires operators to remit fees to the city within 60 days. In response to the audit, the fiscal committee approved the, and moved to the full council several revisions to the existing ordinance. First, this proposal removes the 2,500 person exemption that currently excludes the Washington Pavilion and Orpheum Theater. This proposal also clarifies subsection A, which was originally scheduled to expire in December of 2004. Due to confusion with the existing language, the committee approved more clear cut verbiage, phasing out this provision once the current Sioux Falls Canary season ends in the fall. Once subsection A expires, subsection B fees will apply to all Canary ticket sales. Subsection C was amended to include discretion for the facility operators who under this proposal would have the flexibility to negotiate the ticket fee with concert promoters, professional sports teams, and other organizations that sell tickets at the event center and convention center. And finally, subsection D recognizes the management agreements and allows them to trump ordinance. I'd be happy answering your questions. Thanks, Jim. Council, any questions to Jim? Council Rumbach? You know, uh, this is kind of crazy off the wall, but I'm just looking at your presentation. I had not seen it before this. I've looked at the stuff, obviously, but this is a great way to show the changes in an ordinance so that, that the public can see them as you're talking about them, and I don't have to jump over to Sire to figure out what the wording is. I just, I obviously support this, but I think this is a really great way to present this ordinance change, so I appreciate your work on this. Council, would you mind uh, sending a data hearing second reading for this item? I would, I would be happy to do that. Thank you. I'll, I'll second so that. Been a second. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. <laughs> that is pass 8 0 item 39. A resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving the commemorative renaming of a public street, renaming a portion of West 27th Street between Center and Dakota Avenues to Mark Twain Lane. Uh, good evening. I'm Mike Cooper, City Planning and Building Services, and I'm also acting tonight as chair of our City Naming Committee. Uh, we have received an application for a pretty exciting project, and that is to uh, propose a commemorative naming for an area adjacent to Mark Twain Elementary School. Uh, this application was received by Cassidy and Sarah Jennings, the applicants. And again, it's, it's to commemorate Mark Twain Elementary School that was constructed in 1921 and now is being replaced by a new uh, Susan B. Anthony Elementary School. Uh, the application also included a very uh, significant handwritten letter to Mayor Huther from the applicant and she is here tonight and she would also like to address the city council. The proposed changes for the school, uh, the new school uh, has been constructed on the south side of the site at the old playground area. And now the north side where the school was is being converted into an elementary school playground area. So the area that we're talking about for the commemorative naming would be on the north side of 27th Street between Dakota and Center. Here's some views of that street. Uh, with this commemorative naming, 27th Street would still be in place, but we would be adding another uh, commemoration of the, the school called Mark Twain Lane. This is the uh, outline of what the school used to look like, the architectural style. And we looked at different sign proposals, and the one that we're recommending is on this top that kind of outlines the historic architecture of Mark Twain School. There'll be two signs um, installed by city crews at no cost to the city. We're gonna be using donated funds for the signs. Uh, so again, I'm jumping ahead. The city naming committee met on May 29th and has unanimously recommended approval of this commemorative naming uh, to the city council tonight. And Mayor, the applicant is here tonight very good. Uh, Cassidy, would you mind coming forward, please? And you have the option to either use the podium or we can give you the hand mic. What would you prefer? No. The podium. Yeah. Very good. 
Cassidy, would you mind uh, first just introducing yourself to the people of our town? I'm Cassidy. And your last name, please? Jennings. Thank you, Cassidy Jennings. Welcome, and thank you for your patience. We appreciate it. Go right ahead, Cassidy. Hi, I am Cassidy Jennings, and I just finished fourth grade at Mark Twain Elementary. Thank you for agreeing to consider my application for Mark Twain Lane. Also, thank you to those of you to, who came to Mark Twain for Minecore and other events. Okay, so as you know, I would like to make a commemorative designation to West 27th Street. At the naming committee, we agreed to West 27th Street instead of West 28th Street, and I am happy that they agreed with our suggestion. Anyway, if this commemorative designation happens, no, it would not affect any addresses because it is a commemorative designation, not a street name change. The designation would not cost taxpayers anything because the Mark Twain PTA has agreed to cover the cost. The reason this designation is so important is not only have thousands of kids been educated there, but thousands of kids have been impacted there. There have been generations of families who have memories there, and we would like to keep those memories alive. In fact, I have this petition here. It was an online petition that we printed, and more than 325 students, former students, and other people showed their support by signing it. I would like to thank the City of Sioux Falls Planning Department for considering the application, helping figure out what would work best, and coming up with a really cool design for the sign. Thank you for your time, and I will answer any questions you may have. Uh, Cassidy, thank you. We appreciate that. Um, Cassidy, normally, uh, just hang on, Diane. Uh, uh, Cassidy, the protocol of the city council is that normally we're not supposed to cheer or clap or anything like that. Uh, Councilor Anderson, Jr., with your permission, would you mind if we just for this one opportunity, could we clap? I would approve that. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you, Cassidy. Cassidy, thank you. I think the people of Sioux Falls will, will understand. Uh, with that in mind, uh, is there anyone else that you would want to, could, would you mind just introducing uh, your, your mother, uh, your mom? I know that she played a role in this. Would you mind introducing her to the council and the people of Sioux Falls? Sarah Jennings. Sarah Jennings, would you come forward, please? Thank you, Sarah. We appreciate that. And Cassidy, is there anybody else that you wanted to introduce tonight? My little brother and then my dad. <laughs> your little brother, your dad, and? Jennings, um, Brian Jennings, and then my grandparents are here also. Your grandparents, and do you know their name? Just Graham and oh, Grandpa? No. <laughs> Jean and Don Dolin. Jean and Don, I bet they're also proud of you. Well, very good, <laughs> I am now gonna, well, well I, I, Cassie, I have to ask this. Is there anybody else who wants to speak on behalf of this item in the audience? Counselors? Second, Karski. There has been a motion to approve. It has been seconded, uh, Councilor Anderson, Jr. I just want to say one thing. You keep being an amazing little girl, okay? Thank you. Very good. Councilor Kiley. Wow. <laughs> you know, number one, this take, takes a little bit of the sting out of the uh, name of the school. I was not in favor of a new name. This helps. Thank you very much. Do we have a minimum age requirement for running for city council? <laughs> anyway, consider that. You've got a bright future. <laughs> Very good. Uh, uh, Councilor, there has been a motion. It has been second, seconded. Uh, a roll call, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That motion has passed 8 to 0 overwhelmingly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cassidy, and thank you, Sarah. Item 40. A resolution declaring it necessary to levy and levying a frontage assessment against the lots, tracts, and parcels of land fronting and abutting upon 21st Street from Phillips Avenue to 7th Avenue in the city of Sioux Falls for the purpose of maintaining, planting, and otherwise improving and caring for the center parkways and boulevard thereon. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Kelby Maris with Parks and Recreation. Uh, this resolution before you would levy the assessments of those properties abutting and fronting 21st Street from Phillips Avenue to 7th Avenue. Uh, this assessment has been in place since 1915 and has not changed since 1998. Uh, the assessment rate is for 53 property owners and it is assessed at 85 cents per front foot. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Kelby, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to speak <coughs> to this item? Councilor Staggers. <laughs> yes, I was uh, curious. 
uh, this is the only place in Sioux Falls where we had this kind of assessment, is that right? Yes, is, that I know of, yes. Yeah, has there been any thought of trying to assess other people like this? Um, or just kind of say, we'll let them go ahead and continue to pay, they've been doing it for 100 years. Uh, there's, that discussion hasn't been had that I'm aware of. Councilor Anderson, Jr.? Just a question. Councilor Staggers, uh, I believe you're in that area. Are you looking to get a medium in your block, too? Or? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't need a medium at all. But it, it does, it is really, let's face it, unfair to be assessing these people to you know, maintain the median uh, on 21st Street. This is city property. The city should be paying for it themselves instead of the, the adjacent property owners. If I could reply to that, Mayor, please. Sure, Councilor. Councilman Staggers, the one thing I will say about this, this is voluntary. These, these folks have come to the city and want to continue keeping this, this stretch of roadway looking the way it is, and they're willing to step up and pay for that. I think we should be you know, complimenting them and keeping that uh, roadway to, with its historical significance. If it was truly voluntary, I'd say go ahead. Uh, if we want to make this voluntary, I'll vote for it. But it's not voluntary. Very good. Problem. Councilors, uh, motion. Approval. <laughs> Second Rolfing. Councilor Anderson has made a motion. Second by Councilor um, Rolfing. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. Jameson. Yes. Karski. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. No. Anderson. Yes. That is passed 7 to 1, item 41. A resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, correcting the legal description of annexation resolution number 3315. Diane. Hi, Diane DeCoyer, Planning Office. Sorry for the applause earlier. I was very impressed with her. Very good. I was too. <laughs> <laughs> the annexation um, for item 41 is just a correction to the legal description. The following is what we are adding to that description. Northwest quarter, section 31-T101-48W to the legal description. I can answer any questions you have. Diane, thank you. Anybody in the audience want to speak to this item? Council? Move to approve. Second. Second. It's been a motion to approve this. It has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rothing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0 on 42. A resolution designating the official newspaper for the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And if I could, I will explain. Um, by per state law, we are required to, uh, to declare an official newspaper. This will be for a two-year time period, and we do have a 60-day um, opportunity to cancel if at such future time we're able to publish electronically. So I would ask for your approval at this time. Thank you, Lori. Anybody in the audience want to speak to this item? Joe? No? Okay. For approval, I understand. Got a motion to approve. It has been seconded. A roll call, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Thank you. This is uh, pass 8 to 0. Uh, is that the last item? I think? One more. Uh, 43, please. Four. A resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards, and those names are Elizabeth Schultz and Robbie Vierink to the Board of Historic Preservation, and John Peterson to the Falls Community Health Center Governing Board. Thank you, Lori. Council? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Anderson made that motion to approve. Second by Councilor Erpenbach. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0. Council, thank you much for your efforts tonight. Uh, if there is no further comments, all in favor of adjourning this, say aye. Aye. Opposed? We didn't have a motion. This oh, we need a motion. I'm sorry. Move for adjournment. Move to adjourn. It has been seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much, Sioux Falls. Make it a great night.